So I am presented with a rash and fatigue. To be on the safe side, her physician, Dr. Quill, uh, double-checked her blood count. Her hematocratic was 22, and her white blood count was 4.3. So I'm not a doctor. I'm not quite sure what those are. I probably didn't even pronounce that correctly, but apparently that's a very bad sign. And it meant that she would have to come back in for more tests. Quill didn't want to alarm her, but Diane pressed him, and he said that they were going to be testing for uh, leukemia. So Timothy Quill is a physician. He's not a philosopher. Uh, this article was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this is his retelling of the story of Diane. This is one of his patients with terminal cancer um, who wanted to face death with dignity. So this uh, article was originally published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was one of those that like made waves in the medical community and really shocked some people. So again, this was back in 1991, so we are now 30 years removed from this, and uh, we live in a state where the majority of people uh, agree with physician assisted suicide. It's actually legalized in California. So um, yeah, definitely different time, different place. But uh, I still thought this was a really good article because this is someone actually having to face their death and recounting having to face their death and having to actually think about the what what to consider and so i thought this was a really good article to just reflect on one's own mortality and what the end of life is going to look like so a little bit about diane she was raised in an alcoholic family and she felt alone for much of her life when she was younger unfortunately she had vaginal cancer uh, and throughout her life she struggled with uh, depression and her own alcoholism Seems like uh, her and Dr. Quill had known each other for about seven or eight years or so. Um, and so over that time, Dr. Quill had come to respect her. He had seen her confront her problems face on and gradually overcome them. Um, she was a very clear, uh, brutally honest thinker uh, and communicator. Um, and over the last three years, she had actually abstained from alcohol and she started establishing deeper connections with her husband, her college age son, and her friends. Her business and her artistic uh, passions were flourishing for the first time in her life and Diane felt like she was finally fully living. Which is so sad because the follow-up test showed bad news. Um, she would need to have a bone marrow biopsy to confirm um, and decisions would need to be made very quickly and she would have to start a course of treatment very immediately. So the biopsy confirmed the worst. Myo leochromatic uh, leukemia I'm not quite sure cancer is the answer leukemia is the answer I'm not quite sure what that first word is though um, but yeah so the treatment has about a 25% success rate and again this was at the time but you can still imagine that there's some treatments that are gonna have a 25% success rate so think about it like that so someone who would go through the course of treatment would start with induction therapy. This is going to start with three weeks in the hospital. You have a risk of uh, prolonged neuropenia, uh, probable infectious complications, and hair loss. So 75% of patients respond to that and 25% do not. So of those uh, who survive, uh, they go on to have consolidation chemotherapy. This is going to have similar side effects, uh, stay in the hospital, uh, neuropenia, infectious complications, and again, hair loss. Another 25% in this group is going to die for a net survival of 50%. So to have a reasonable chance of long-term survival, they're gonna need a bone marrow transplant. This is gonna mean another two months of, uh, in the hospital, full body radiation, uh, which means completely killing all the bo bone marrow, uh, which is gonna open them to a lot of infectious complications 
And there's always a possibility of, uh, you know, even once they get the bone marrow transplant, that they could have graft-versus-host disease. <laughs> and, yeah. So about another approximately 50% uh, of uh, patients survive the bone marrow transplant or the, just the procedure and the recovery. And so that leaves for about a net group, uh, a net percentage of 25% of people uh, survive from the original group. So some doctors might disagree about the exact percentages, but everyone agrees that no treatment certainly means death within a few days, a few weeks, maybe you have a few months. So when they broke the news, uh, Dr. Quill and her oncologist broke the news to Diane, the oncologist started uh, making plans for her treatment. Um, this was devastating though to her. She was overwhelmed by the finality of the d uh, diagnosis and she was enraged at the presumption that she would want treatment. She definitely wasn't ready to talk about treatment then. Actually, now that she was forced to think about it, she had decided she didn't want treatment. She just wanted to go home and be with her family. So Quill comforted her um, and you know, just wanted to make sure that she understood the risks of delaying treatment but, um, and let her go home, but, you know, asked her to come back in a couple days. Two days later, Diane returned with her family. They had talked it through and through, and she remained clear that she did not want to go through chemo. Instead, she wanted to live the, what time she had left outside of the hospital, which sounds pretty fair. It was clear that Diane was convinced that she was going to die in the course of treatment, and that it was gonna be at the process of unspeakable pain. Specifically, she thought that the, um, you know, she's thinking of the hospitalizations, the lack of control over her body from the side effects from the chemo, uh, but then also just the pain and anguish of the disease itself. So Quill couldn't disagree with her. Um, he didn't say this to her, but um, there were four patients in the hospital, in that hospital, uh, that had just recently died at different stages in treatment, so, and all very painful. This is one of the things that um, we're not gonna talk about, but in terms of like truth-telling to patients, this is one of those things that's like, yes, you should always tell them the truth about questions they ask, but you don't always need to be forthright about this. Um, similar thing with Kant. So really, the principles don't lie. It's not don't tell the truth, it's just, because um, you understand that you might have certain knowledge that might overwhelm the patient in a certain way. So that's, you know, something to think about in terms of like the ethics of truth telling. Um, okay, so back to Diane. So her family wished that she would get treatment, but they sadly accepted her decisions. Um, Diane had clearly articulated that she was the one who was going to experience all the side effects, and she did not think that a 25% chance was good enough to undergo such a toxic course of treatment. So Quill made sure that Diane fully understood what she was deciding, um, and actually he was impressed by her remarkable understanding of the situation and her grasp of her options and the likely outcomes. Quill remarked that he often advocates for patient's autonomy and the right to die with dignity, um, but he also was surprised that she was willing to give up on a 25% chance of long-term survival. Again, for almost certain death. And he also half expected her to change her mind, and he knew that there was a small window of opportunity where uh, treatment would still be effective. So he met with her several times over that week. They went and got a second consultation. They went and talked to a psychiatrist that she had talked to in the past. And actually over, the, uh, over that week, Quill was the one who, whose opinion had changed. He, he gradually came to understand her perspective and that he understood that she was making the right decision for her. Um, this was a little bit eerie to me to think about because um, while she was still healthy, she helped prepare for when she wasn't gonna be healthy. Um, she helped arrange hospice care to make sure that she was comfortable with all the time that she had left. Um, I, that's one of the sadder things that I thought about when I was reading this was having to be in charge of taking care of yourself in the future. So just as Quill was starting to see things from Diane's perspective, uh, Diane pushed back it a little bit more. 
So it was important to her that she maintain control and dignity with the time that she had left. But when this was no longer possible, it was clear that she wanted to die. Quill was kind of the perfect person to help her out. He had actually been the head of a hospice program before, so he knew how to comfort patients and ease their suffering. But Diane was worried about lingering in a state of what's called relative comfort. Um, and she just really wasn't interested in this kind of easing the, comforts, uh, easing the patient's comfort. Diane was clear that when the time came, she wanted to end her life in the least painful way possible, which totally makes sense. So, you know, now seeing things from her perspective, Quill agrees. He also thinks it makes sense. Um, however, uh, from, you know, this was outside the currently accepted medical you know, practice and it was more than he could offer. Quill noted that Diane was preoccupied with the fear of lingering death and that getting, uh, it was getting in the way of her getting the most out of the time she had left. He feared that she might attempt a violent suicide. Um, worse, uh, that she might be unsuccessful and that it might leave her in the state of lingering death um, that she didn't want in the first place. Yeah, man, I can't imagine that, but yeah. But also, it might get even worse. If she can't do this herself, she might ask a family member to assist, and that person then might be, you know, legally responsible. So, considering all these things, Quill directed Diane to uh, the Hemlock Society. A week later, Diane called Quill to request barbiturates to help her sleep. Recognizing that this was also an essential ingredient in the Hemlock Society suicide, he asked her to come to his office to talk it over. Part of this was a superficial meeting to cover his ass, uh, to make sure, you know, to talk about her insomnia. But also, it was to make sure that the despair hadn't overwhelmed her or that it wasn't coloring her judgment. It was clear that Diane was still making deeper connections with her uh, family and friends and that securing the means to the end of her life would allow her to actually live in the present. So Quill prescribed Diane the barbiturates and he explained how much would help her with her sleep and also how much would be necessary for her to end her own life. So they continued to meet regularly and Diane actually promised Quill that they would meet before she took her life to make sure that she had exhausted all possible options. But Quill was still conflicted. He felt like he was pushing his spiritual, legal, professional, and personal boundaries. But at the same time, it felt clear to him that he was helping his patient. The next couple of months sounded intense. Her son stayed home from college for that semester and her husband started working from home. She spent as much time as she could with them, but she also uh, started hanging out with close friends. She even went to the hospital to give a talk about patients' rights for refused treatment. But it wasn't all easy. Uh, Diane went through bouts of anger and sadness. Um, and several times she became weak. She had to receive transfusions uh, and she actually responded fairly well. After three months of tumultuous time, uh, there was two weeks of relative calm and there was a prayer of a miracle, but nope, that's not how this one ends. Of course, uh, bone pain, weakness, fatigue, fevers started to dominate her life. So they tried to minimize her pain as much as possible, but it was clear that uh, the end was near. This is a quote from uh, Quill here. So, Diane's immediate future held what she feared most, an increased discomfort, dependence, and hard choices between pain and sedation. So Diane started to say her goodbyes and she was telling her friends that she'd be leaving soon. Man, that's sad. She met with Quill for one last time and uh, Quill noted that Diane was sad and frightened, but um, that she was more terrified to be staying in the thoughts of suffering, so. Yeah, it's, you might think of this as a blessing, but it's still something that's hard for people to face. Two days later, her husband called Quill to tell him that Diane had died. She had said her final goodbyes to her husband and son that morning and asked to be left alone for an hour. 
they respected her wishes and after what probably felt like forever, they came back to find her peacefully lying on the couch covered in her favorite shawl. So they also called Quill to find out how to proceed. So he came over, then they reminisced about Diane, about her life, and about the unfairness of her illness. Quill then called the medical examiner and informed him that a hospice patient had died and said that the cause of death was acute leukemia. Although this was technically true, it clearly was not the whole story. But any mention of a suicide would have sparked what is pretty unnecessary of a course of actions. So it might have sparked a police investigation, or an ambulance crew might have shown up to try and resuscitate her. Diane might have become a coroner's case, and the medical examiner would have been the one to decide if she needed an autopsy. So her family, Quill, could have also been subject to criminal prosecution, and Quill could have been subject to professional review. Although they believed that they had given Diane the best care and you know, respected her autonomy the best uh, they possibly could, Quill did not think that the law or society or the medical profession saw it that way. And so that's why he said acute leukemia, to protect himself and her family from liabilities, um, but also to protect Diane from an invasion into her past and into her body. And the way Quill saw it, uh, he was protecting society from the ugly truth about the pain and suffering of dying. Given current social constraints, uh, a, patient can, a patient's pain can be managed, uh, but cannot be completely eliminated or made benign. Made benign. So this is a quote from Quill. Diane taught me about the range of ways I can help provide if I know people well and I allow them to say what they really want. She taught me about life and death and honesty and about taking charge in, in facing tragedy squarely when it strikes. She taught me that I can take small risks for people that I really know and care about. Okay, so one thing I want you guys to be thinking about is uh, how has this story about Diane impacted you? What has it taught you about either the end of life or things like that? Um, just generally your own mortality, yeah. So yes, there are certainly ways of lessening and controlling people's pain, but to think that uh, suffering in the process of dying that we can eliminate it is a complete illusion. Prolonged dying can be peaceful, but most often a physician is limited to lessening, not eliminating severe pain. So this experience radically shifted the way Quill saw end-of-life care, and he was someone who was actually the head of a hospice. So he was someone who was advocating on that behalf, someone who was very pro, like, let's lessen your pain, we don't need to resort to euthanasia. But even he was eventually came around to seeing Diane's perspective. And now going through this himself made him wonder how many other patients and physicians were privately going through this experience themselves or how many patients couldn't bring it up to their doctors and they were secretly dying alone in despair. It made him consider whether the Hemlock Society's approach might actually be more benign. So yeah, these are other things I want you guys to be considering before we come to class. <laughs>